أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بعد الله رحمة للعالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Today the 16th of August 18th Muharram 1444 uh, We continue with the third lesson of الوصية الصغرى الشيخ الإسلام التيمية رحمه الله تعالى His advice to القسم السبتي المغربي رحمه الله uh, we're going to go straight into where we left off, inshallah, which was, uh, I'm not sure what page this is. I'm not either. Shalom, page nine. The comprehensive of the wasi is page eight. This is page eight here? Yes. Play. Uh, <clears throat> now, so we're going we're gonna to start right away. We're going to get straight into the lesson, inshallah. And... In case I forget, there's no class next week, bi'idhnillah. Class will resume on August 30th, bi'idhnillah, at 6.30, not 7 o'clock. 6.30 p.m., August 30th, inshallah ta'ala, because Maghrib is moving back. Fadl, Sheikh. Min Ustadhina and Dr. Tahir Wyatt, naqra'u al-kitab, the concise legacy. Min Sheikh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, the Safat, the Maniyah, the comprehensiveness of the Wasiyah. What makes this legacy so comprehensive is the fact that it covers the two rights upon the human being. One, the responsibility towards Allah, the mighty and sublime. Two, the responsibility towards Allah's servants. Tayyip. This Tayyip. No, stop there, inshallah. All right, so uh, Shaykh al-Islam, rahmatullahi alayhi, he, after mentioning that this wasiyah of the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi is comprehensive, he's showing why it's so comprehensive, and that's because it covers two, the two areas. One is the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the second is the rights of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a person fulfills those rights, the rights of Allah and the rights of the creation, then he does what he has been created for. And so what we're going to look at uh, first is the rights or the responsibility that we have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, this wasiyah, right, is the advice that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave to who? Not a, that. What? It, 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 Shaykh al-Islam gave the advice to Abu al-Qasim. The Prophet ﷺ gave advice to who? Mu'ad. To Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Radiyallahu anhu. And we mentioned that from his virtues is that the Prophet ﷺ would keep him close to him. So he would actually ride behind the Prophet ﷺ sometimes on the whatever the Prophet ﷺ was riding. And that meant that he would be in close proximity, physical proximity to the Prophet Sallallahu And that's one of the virtues of Mu'ad. Remember that from last, last week? Mm -hmm. Let us read that, the one hadith, because this clarifies the responsibility that we have to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Fadl Sheikh. Right here. Uh, yes, Fadl. Oh, Narrated Mu'ad, radiallahu anhu, I was a companion rider of the Prophet والسلام, on a donkey called Ufayr. The Prophet والسلام, asked, Ya Mu'ad, do you know what Allah's right on his slaves is? And what the right of his slaves upon him is? I replied, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, Allah's right on his slaves is that they should worship him alone and should not worship any besides him. And the law is right upon Allah. And again? And the law is right. And the slaves right. Upon and the slaves him. right on Allah is that he should not punish him who worships none besides him. And he, so the Prophet والسلام, here is laying out those responsibilities or that major responsibility that we have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is that we worship Allah alone not ascribing any partners to him. So the right of Allah is not just that we worship him, but that we worship him what? Alone. Alone. That nothing else we worship the law side Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And if the slave does that, then Allah Azza wa Jal will not punish him. Allah Azza wa Jal will not punish the person who does that. No. I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, والسلام, should I not inform the people of this good news? He said, do not inform them of it, lest they should depend upon it. Absolutely. Bukhari wa Muslim. Uh, so, here's an interesting part here. And, and I think this, this is often missed with this hadith of the Prophet Allah Azza wa is talking about whose rights in this, in this hadith. His rights. Stop there. Stop there. He's talking about his rights, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that his right is to be worshipped alone. So we have other ahadith that clarify that anybody who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then Allah Azza wa Jalla will not punish them. And then, like in the hadith of uh, Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah says, O son of Adam, you know, if you come to me with the earths full of sins, I will come to you with even more mercy. If you meet me, not ascribing partners with me. Tayyip. Again, that's whose rights? Allah's right. Tayyip. Has hmm. not Allah Azza wa Jal given the creation rights? Right? Like, as a parent, don't you have rights over your children? Don't your children have rights over you? As a husband, you have rights over your wife. Your wife has rights over you. Tayyip. Allah Azza wa Jal here is talking about his rights over you. So if you are making dhulm to the people, even if you don't do any shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't you still have to be held accountable for that? That is a part that people often miss. They read this hadith and they think, khalas, as long as I'm a Muslim, I don't commit any shirk, I'm good. La. You're good with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of his rights. And Allah azza wa jalla forgive you. And, and hukuk Allah azza wa jalla aslan mabni ala al musamaha. At the end of the day, Allah Azza wa Jal is uh, all forgiving. He's most merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his rights are built on musamaha, meaning Allah Azza wa Jal pardons. But Allah Azza wa Jal is just. And so just like you want your rights from the people that have done you wrong, the people you've done wrong also want their rights. And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, I mean, to his companions, Atadaruna men and muflis. Atadaruna men and muflis. Do you know who the one who is bankrupt is. They said the one who doesn't have any money. That's the person who's considered muflis, bankrupt. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, but he's the one who comes on a day with all of these a'mal kal jibal. And he's got all of these good deeds that he's done. The fasting and the, and the prayer and the hajj and the umrah and, and paid his zakat and all of that good stuff. He insulted this one. He, he, he shed the blood of that one. He hit this one, right? And so that one takes his good deeds and that one takes his good deeds until he's left with no good deeds. And I'm mentioning that here because the hadith, this is the hadith of Mu'adh. He was riding behind the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu told him this. But what was the advice that the Prophet Sallallahu gave to Mu'adh before he went to Yemen? اتَّقِ اللَّهَ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُ وَأَتْبِعِ سَيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْهُهَا وَخَالِقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلُقِ حَسَنٍ That's part of that. It's part of your taqwa. Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under all circumstances. Follow up a bad deed with a good deed that will erase it. And deal with the people properly with good akhlaq. So, again, when you read these ahadith that are talking about the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Him not punishing you if you don't commit shirk, don't forget that there are people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given rights over you as well. If you don't fulfill those rights and you don't make things right, Allah Jal is just. Allah Jal is just. In the same way that you want their, your rights, they want their rights. So, Allah Jal and he created mankind for a very noble purpose. And and I'm emphasizing this point here because your relationships need to focus, revolve around that purpose for what we were created, which is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have not created jinn and mankind except to command them with my worship, 
Allah Azza wa Jalla has commanded us to worship him alone, he created us for that purpose. And your relationships have to be based on that. Your relationships with people, you have to evaluate that. Is this relationship that I have with this person, is it helping me to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better or is it taking me away from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Your marriage has to be based on that. It's not all this Disney stuff people are involved in. Head over heels for somebody, you fall in love and all this other stuff. I'll tell you by then. I mean, how long is that supposed to last? And is it helping you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this person that you're involved with, do you all both have the same goal of helping each other on the journey? Right? Because ultimately, all of us are on a journey. And you're just a, 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 somebody that's strange in the land. And you're, you're a commuter at the end of the day. You're just moving through. And on the journey, on any journey, journeys are difficult. And so when you're traveling by yourself, you got to do everything for yourself. And when somebody else is on a journey with you, it's easy. Because sometimes you can take, take the load and then sometimes they can take the load. But you're helping each other on that journey at the end of the day. And that's what this is about. It's about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his right over us is that we worship him alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we, if we go back and we look right here, this advice is about what? Number one, the responsibility towards Allah, mighty and sublime, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that that responsibility is what? That we worship him alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. His right over us is ibadah. I'm not going to go into a very long definition of ibadah, but I do think that there's some abiyat from Nuniya, some, some verses from Nuniya by uh, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, that clarify the two main elements of, of ibadah. And those two are uh, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and humility. And in some instances, you can say love and reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi says, وَعِبَادَةُ الرَّحْمَانِ غَايَةُ حُبِّهِ مَعَذُ لِعَابِدِهِ هُمَا قُطْبَانِ The worship of Ar-Rahman is, number one, the epitome of loving it. It's to reach the epitome of loving him. غَايَةُ حُبِّهِ مَعَذُ لِعَابِدِهِ in addition to the humility of his slave. So we're talking about love, hub, and humility, which is dhul. وَإِبَادَةُ الرَّحْمَانِ غَايَةُ حُبِّهِ مَعَ ذُلِّ عَابِدِهِ هُمَا قُطْبَانِ Those two are the axes. Right? And around rich, and then he goes on to say, وَعَلَيْهِمَا فَلَكُ الْعِبَادَةِ دَائِرٌ مَا دَارَ حَتَّى قَامَتِ الْقُطْبَانِ Around them, the orbit of worship revolves. So around these two, like consider these two to be the axes, okay? And around them revolve the concept of, of worship. وَعَلَيْهِمَا فَلَكُ الْعِبَادَةِ دَائِرٌ The orbit of worship revolves around those two. And then he goes on to say, وَمَدَارُهُ بِالْأَمْلِ أَمْلِ رَسُولِهِ لَا بِالْهَوَى وَالنَّفْسِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ And its rotation is upon the command. That is, the command of the Prophet ﷺ is not about, يعني, worship is not about your hawa, doing it whatever way you want to do it, or your nafs, whatever you desire, what shaytan or whatever shaytan is telling you to do. And that's because some people, they worship Allah on their terms. So that's where bid'ah comes from. That's where... Hawa comes in and people just do what they, they want to do. Because they're not worshipping Allah on his terms. The worship is about the command. Amri Rasulihi. The command of his messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. La bil hawa wa nafsi wa shaytani. It's not about what your hawa wants you to do or whatever is pleasing to your nafs. Or what shaytan may whisper to somebody. فَقِيَامُ دِينِ اللَّهِ بِالْإِخْلَاسِ وَال so the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, stands upon, it is established upon ikhlas and ihsan. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely 
and worshiping him with ihsan, which is excellence. Meaning, according to the teachings of the Prophet, in a manner that shows that you are worshiping Allah as if you can see him. Those two are the foundation of, of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ibadah, ibadah, in order for it to be considered يعني, real worship, okay, to worship Allah is to love him and to display that humility together. The love and humility together. And Shaykh al-Islam rahmatullah has a whole risala uh, treatise that, that uh, was explained, alhamdulillah, in this masjid on al-ubudiyyah, which goes into the worship in depth. So to sum it up, inshallah, Father uh, Shaykh. The Prophet والسلام's advice, Allah's rights, observe taqwa. Make up for any deficiency. Please stop there. So, so Sheikh al-Islam is talking about how this advice is compre <coughs> comprehensive. And that's because the advice of the Prophet is <coughs> inclusive of Allah's rights and the creation's rights. As it comes in this particular hadith, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to observe taqwa. And taqwa is what? If, if we want to make it as simple as possible, doing what Allah loves and staying away from what He, what he does not approve of, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To do what Allah loves, you have to know what He loves. And to stay away from what He does not love, you have to also, you also have to know those things that Allah does not approve of. And the worst of those things are al kabair, right? The major sins. Al-Dhahabi has a, a very famous book called Al-Kaba'ir. And the ulama يعني, have written those books on Kaba'ir. Why do you think they write books about major sins? To try to find to stay away from. Right. Because in order, again, in order to stay away from what Allah does not like, you have to know what Allah does not like. There are certain things that fitratan, يعني, innately, you know that this is not something that's right. Like those are certain things that you know inside of you, but there may be other things that are that are from the major sins that may not be apparent to someone that they are from the major sins, especially if they come up in a certain environment where those things are normal, like gossip, backbiting. Backbiting is a major sin. Ghiba is a major sin. Namima is a worse sin. walidain. Yani being undutiful and unkind to your parents and so forth. That's a major sin. In this society, it's normal. It's normal. Matter of fact, it's been, unfortunately, it's not just normal. It's like they, it's like they teach it. It's like they teach it. The, 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 the TV programs, every Disney movie is built on what? On somebody doing them. Uh, as they say, huh? forget what your parents think. Forget them. They'll come around. Matter of fact, you do you, your parents will come around at the end. This is how your children are being indoctrinated. Right? That's, that's what society, you do what you, think is, what you think is best for you. Do what you think is best for you. And then by day, your parents, they come around. And so this stuff is, this stuff is normal. So, Rukuk al is from the greatest sins in Islam. And to be undutiful to your parents, it's from the greatest sins in Islam. Eliza, the, the point here is that you have to know what is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you stay away from it. And this is why the scholars have written books on, on Kabbaj. So, Allah's rights is to observe taqwa. Do what he commanded. The greatest of what Eliza does commanded us with is a tawheed, to worship him alone. And to make up for any deficiencies in taqwa. Who have followed up that bad deed with a good deed, it will erase it. So those are the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the ulama break this down a little bit differently. I'm only going to mention it here because I think it's useful. So they say that 
making up for deficiencies actually comes under the creation's rights. Hmm. Because you are one of Allah's creations. And so by making up for deficiency, that's the right that your nafs has over you. Because you fell short in number one, which is Allah's rights. And so the creation's rights are broken up into the rights that you have over yourself and the rights that the rest of the creation has over you. And not just people, by the way. Because the rest of the creation includes this, the earth that we live on. It has rights. Animals have rights. Insects have rights. So your right over yourself, right, that you make up for the deficiencies in, in fulfilling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right. But the other way to look at that is that if you fall short in number one, which is the observation of taqwa, then making that up is actually the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you, that you do your best to, to fill in the gaps in, in what you have, in, in any deficiency that you have in observing his rights, which we'll talk about in a second, inshallah ta'ala. And then the creation's rights, so khaliq and nas bikhuluqin hasan, that you deal with them appropriately, benevolently. And that is something that, inshallah, uh, when we get there, it'll, it'll be clear in the day ta'ala, probably in the fifth class, inshallah. So not next week, but the week, uh, not class four, which is on August 30th, inshallah, but the class after that, in the day ta'ala. Fellowship. This wasiyah also takes account of the fact that each person will be deficient in fulfilling this responsibility. For example, by missing a duty or something or doing something forbidden. Number one, abandoning. No, so stop there. So Sheikh Islam goes on to say that this will see it takes account of the fact that each person will be deficient in fulfilling this responsibility. With them, Bu'arayi Hetzman. And he, no doubt that a person is going to sin and that a person is going to fall short in fulfilling that responsibility that they have either in their fulfilling their rights to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or fulfilling the rights of the creation and this is not a for example by the way that for example is something that the uh, translator added it should just take away for example if you have it there you can scratch it out say fulfilling this responsibility by missing a duty huh, or doing something forbidden. So there's two ways that we fall short. There's two ways that we sin. The first is that you miss a duty, right? So number one, abandoning an obligation or you do something that is haram. You do something that has been forbidden. So those are the two ways that we fall short in what? In taqwa. All right? In fulfilling those rights in general. The way that we fall short is, number one, that we abandon an obligation, or number two, that we do something that is prohibited. The Prophet والسلام, said that Allah Azza wa Jal says, and this is the hadith of Abu Dhar, I believe it's hadith 24 in al arbaeen is collected by the man Muslim. Ya ibadi innakum tukhti'una bil layli wal nahar wa ana aghfiru dhunuba jami'an fastaghfiruni aghfir lakum. Now, follow the shaykh. Oh my servants. Oh my servants, you sin by night and by day and I forgive all sins. So seek forgiveness of me and I shall forgive you. Yani, why is that important to note here? Because Shaykh al-Islam says that each person will be deficient in fulfilling his responsibility. And that is directly come from the, the, in, the, in the Arabic it says, with them ba'alihi hatmun, I think, or something like that. Yani, a sin, you are always going to have sins. And Allah says to his, to, he calls out, Ya ibadi innakum. Right? You, you sin by night and by day. You fall short day and night. And subhanAllah, this should take us back and remind us of the, the book that we read, Journey to Allah, Ibn Rajab, where a person recognizes that their actions are not what is going to get them into Jannah. And if Allah took us to account for just one of his 
favors that he has done for us, the blessings. Uh, SubhanAllah. Uh, I got a question. I, I bring it. I don't know. just came to my mind. But a question came to me about is, is not eating halal. This is the question. Is not eating halal haram like eating pork? <laughs> is not eating halal haram like eating pork? <laughs> and so before you get into the whole, okay, how the meat is slaughtered in this country and so on and so forth and the, not doing the biha. Here's the question. Why don't you just eat the biha? What's the issue? Here, especially. Especially here, right? In Philly, like, there's not too many, you, you can't really go like a mile radius where you can't find halal, like as in the biha. So, here's the, so the question is, why wouldn't you just eat the biha? You know what the answer is, right? It's just not convenient sometimes. It's just not convenient. It's not convenient? Yeah. It's not convenient sometimes. Huh? I would thought he would say it was too expensive. Nah. Nah. So, no, the, the issue is always convenience. <laughs> always. Or, you know, we just don't have a halal whatever they want to eat at that particular time. You don't have a halal Big Mac or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Stuff is nasty anyway. So, the... the so, so the issue is, when you recognize Allah Azawajal's favor of being able to taste food, that's a, that's a nema. It's a nema. And, and when you have a cold, you recognize that nema. But, but we take so many of these favors for granted. You take for granted that you have a digestive system that you don't have to think about. It just works by itself. But somebody that's dealing with, for example, irritable bowel syndrome or something, they don't take that stuff for granted, right? So my, my point is that when we, when we recognize these favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we then recognize that we don't have the ability to thank Allah for those favors. And therefore, your actions don't get you an agenda. Because you can't even thank Allah for, for the favors that you have. And on top of that, Ya ibadi inna kum tukhti'una bil layli wa nahar. My servants, you, you're sinning day and night. You, you're steadily doing something. Right? Falling short in something. Wa ana aghfiru dhunuba jami'ah. But I forgive all sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Fastaghfiruni aghfir lakum. And we'll talk about istighfar in a minute, inshaAllah. Nah. The Messenger والسلام, said, Fear Allah wherever you may be. This statement is comprehensive. And his words, wherever you may be, confirm that the human being is in need of taqwa, both secretly and in the open. Secretly and in the open. That's not a place. That's not a place. That's a condition. And this is why when we talk about fearing Allah under all circumstances. kunt. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't just mean the place that you are in, all right? That was why sirwan wa ananiya, secretly and in the open, publicly, yeah. He then said, follow up a bad deed with a good one. All right, so we're finished with the first part of the hadith. We said that, that the hadith has three phrases. The first is, taqillah haytha ma kunt, have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Under all circumstances. The second phrase is, Follow up a bad deed with a good deed, which will erase it. No. We can see the wisdom behind this by looking at a man who eats something which is bad for him. After which, the doctor prescribes him to take something which will cure him. It so, so is the cure itself something that is... Um, is it... Is it wanted? Is it something desirable in and of itself? Or is it only desirable because something bad happened first? You don't, just, you, don't just take, you don't just take medicine, right? You don't just take medicine to cure something. It, it, there's something bad that happened. There's, there's, or like he says here, he ate something that, that disagreed with him or whatever. And then, um, and then the, the prescription is made, right? So, and we'll see why this is important in a second. Go ahead. Hold on. It is inevitable 
that a human being will commit sin. Now, this is what we were referring to before. It's inevitable that a human being will commit sins. Now, so the wise person is the one who continuously do, does good deeds in order that the effects of his bad deeds are canceled out. Right. So you, those good deeds are being done to do what? To cancel out the bad deeds. And that's because the good deeds that a person does is either is either because you want to do something good for the sake of doing good or you're doing a good deed because you want to erase the effect of something bad that you have done. All right. In this hadith, the phrase bad deed is used first because the purpose here is to wipe out bad deeds rather than do, to do good deeds. This is similar to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying about the Bedouin's urine. Pour over his urine a bucket of water. All right. So, so this, is, this is rhetorical, balaghi uh, point that Shaykh al-Islam is making. So it, it's linguistic in nature. It may be difficult to articulate this in, in English. But he, he's comparing this to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, pour over it, yani his urine, a bucket of water. And he didn't say pour a bucket of water over it. He said, what did he say first? Pour over it. Pour over the urine a bucket of water. Because the idea is, is to erase the, the, the traces of, of the urine. And so the Prophet Sallallahu here is saying, Whereas in it's not like the Prophet Sallallahu said, if al hasanata ba'da asiyya. Because the the, the the point here is not that the person is initiating the good deed for the sake of doing the good deed. The point is actually to erase the bad deed that a person does. And this part of the hadith is, is, is quite important. And inshallah, I want you to, to actually do a little thinking about this with your partner. So, Sheikh Mukhtar. Self-auditing. Work with a partner. Yeah. Explain. Muhasabatu and nafs. Muhasabatu nafs. Self auditing. All right? Tell you. What, what is an audit? They just put $80 billion into the IRS. If they put $80 billion in, you know they expect to get at least, you know, a trillion, a trillion back. What, what's an audit? What, what well, it's when you look at something, you look at how it was done, what it was done for, it didn't fulfill that purpose. Ah, okay. So big companies, especially big companies, they do what they call what? Internal, huh? Audit. Internal audits. Because they want to make sure everything is straight before the big boys, before the big boys come. <laughs> Three letters, huh? Before the big boys come. They want to make sure all their stuff is, is straight internally. So muhasaba to nafs is your internal audit. It's what you do for yourself before you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before you have no chance. By, at that point, it's too late. You can't fix it. With the internal audits, why do they do internal audits in the first place? Because if something doesn't add up, then they have a chance to fix some things before, before the big boys come in. Mm. Right. Tayyip. So, muhasaba to nafs. Uh, read the, the questions on the side, Shaykh. Explain two similarities between this ayah and the Prophet's statement. Follow up a bad deed with a good one. Allah says, Ya Read the English. Mention at least. Read the English of the oh, translation. No. O people of faith, have taqwa of Allah and let each soul look to, look to what it has sent for it for tomorrow. Have taqwa of Allah. Indeed, Allah is fully aware, khabir, of all you do. All right. So first thing is you're going to explain two similarities between this ayah and the Prophet Sallallahu statement, follow up a bad deed with a good, good one. All right. Then. Mm. Mention at least one way that the last phrase of the ayah relates to. The first part of the ayah. Right. The last phrase of the ayah is indeed Allah is khabir of all you do. Tell you, you have 90 seconds to work with your partner. Um, 
That's, that's a minute and a half in case, uh, in case anybody didn't know. Go ahead. Partner up. Wait, I can't hear you. Let me hear you. For every bad deed, follow with a good one. So, and Allah said, evaluate yourself. Yeah. So you can't, you can't, you can't realize you have already committed. You cannot evaluate yourself. Right. So that is the first part. Let's evaluate it for the first one. Okay. For the second one, make sure at least one way that in the last place of the ayah you need to the first part of the ayah. So we'll let you answer because I'm, I'm deaf in one ear, so it's hard for me to hear. I can't answer. I'll let you answer. Yeah, that is the, that is the two points. Yeah, Five seconds left. Time is up. All right. I'm ready to listen. Barakallahu feekum. Where's your partner? Oh, okay. Kareem? No, I know, I know. I was looking at Anwar in the back. <laughs> I didn't see you. I didn't see Kareem back there. All right. Give me, give me, uh, give me one way that it's similar. Un it's unnecessary. Go ahead. Yeah. Speak up. The first part um, where it says, um, uh, follow up a good deed with a bad deed. Mm. I mean, follow up you know, a bad deed with a good deed. And then it's, it, it, it's related to uh, that every soul look at what he has set forth, that's set forward for tomorrow. Mm. Tomorrow meaning that day when you meet Allah. Mm. So you do a good deed, you do a, uh, you, you do a, you do a bad deed, mm -hmm. you do a good deed to make it up because tomorrow yeah. you're going to meet Allah. So you got to clean it up before you before you meet Allah. So, so what's the similarity then? Explain the similarity. We said that what you send forward is your deeds, your bad deeds. What you send forward is your good your deeds, period. Uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have your good deeds to wipe out your bad deeds, Tomorrow if you're good deeds, alhamdulillah, Allah is Rahim, Ghafoor. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, Muhammad. Follow up your following up your bad deeds with good deeds is taqwa. Play it. Mm. Yeah. Self um, self evaluation. Ah, come That's on. It. Yeah, come on. Self evaluation. Because uh, after Allah said, look what is set for. Ah. So that's the self evaluation. You have to always. So if you're looking, if, yeah. if you, if self evaluation, that internal audit, has of it to nafs, take an account, right? Because in, when you're looking forward to what you sent, to, or when you're looking to what you sent forward to tomorrow, that requires you to what? Evaluate. That, that requires self evaluation to look forward. To, that means you're thinking about it, right? And, and this is why the scholars say that, that this ayah is aslun huh? fi al muhasaba. Yani it is, when we look at, when, when they say asl here, they mean a, a, a primary dalil, okay? For the obligation of muhasaba to nafs. Because Allah is commanding us to look for it, right? Wal tandur nafs. That, that is a, a command form. Wal tandur nafs. Yani every soul needs to look forward to what is sent for tomorrow. How does that, so that's, that's what the ayah is saying. How is that similar to the hadith? So the hadith said, it said, um, it said, it said, uh, what be sayyatul hasana. So what etbi is sayyatul hasana. So following up the bad deed with the good deed yes. requires that you what? Look forward. That, Look forward. that you evaluate because there's no way to follow up the bad deed with a good deed unless you know what your bad deeds are. As Sheikh Al-Sam is going to talk about in the, in the next little section, inshallah. So, so the first 
thing that combines them, or one of the things that, that is similar between the ayah and the hadith, is the obligation of muhasabatu and nafs. The obligation of doing that internal audit, that self evaluation. What's another similarity? And this one is in structure. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. And also using that to self-audit yourself and to realize that, you know, there's... Tell you, you're, you're almost there, Kareem. Um, so another similarity is, like, tying it to the journey of Allah, it's never, <laughs> like, it's never enough good deeds. Like, you're always constantly going because it's known that you're going to sin. So you're always trying to wash that away with a good deed uh, uh, everything all of y'all are saying is true but I want exactly the I, so I, I'll, I'll give it to you what, the Prophet Sallam said what to Muaz first how did he start gave him a command he gave him a command to, of what of taqwa and then he said muhasaba here Allah says have taqwa and then what look forward so it starts off with taqwa and then and then muhasaba and the hadith, the hadith is structured the same way. Have taqwa and then, and then muhasaba. You, you caught it? Yes. All right. I, I'm bringing that up because, inshallah, if you get it, you won't forget it. Inshallah. Okay? If you get it, you won't forget it. But how, what is the last part? And that, this is just from, from tadabbur, right? Just that you contemplate the Quran. Because when Allah Jal completes an ayah by mentioning his names... Okay, and, and oftentimes uh, he'll mention two names coupled together. Th there's a direct relationship between the name that Allah is concluding the ayah with and what has proceeded in, in the ayah. So it's just to get you to think about it. This one is really clear and straightforward, right? In the law, Khabirun Bima Ta'amalun, Allah is fully aware of all you do, and He's telling you to do what? Have taqwa in and think about what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. And, and so he wants you to know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he already knows all of that. And there's nothing that taqfa min kum Yeah, what's up, Shaykh? Is it possible that the second taqwa is the, the good deed following up the bad deed recognized from the Muhammad? Very possible. Now, nah, alhamdulillah. The second one in the ayah. The, okay. the second one in the ayah have taqwa of Allah. Because yani, Allah uh, put the muhasib between the two taqwas. Right? Between yeah. the two commands of taqwa. So the first one is have taqwa of Allah. You're going to fall short. Huh? You're going to fall short. So when you look at what you sent forward for tomorrow, you'll see that you fell short. So have taqwa of Allah by following up your shortcomings with a, with a good deed. And that's even a, a nicer point of how this ayah, you know, is, or, or how the hadith resembles the, the ayah. Now, and then here. Another command. So the two commands in a row. Now, yeah. Is the last statement in reference to Taqwa because of the definition you gave in the first class that you would, um, the definition of Taqwa consists of Iman and Ihtisad. Iman and Ihtisad. Yeah, that, that works as well. That works as well, mashallah. Khalas, we got to move. <laughs> Go ahead. He said, Aizuma uh, Kuta. And Allah said, indeed, Allah is fully aware of all what you do. Nah. So, it's talking about the situation, the time, everything. So, Allah and Allah... Nah. And Allah, khabirun bima ta'amalun, he's khabir of what you do, wherever you do it, whenever you do it, and under any circumstance. Alhamdulillah. Very good. Fadal Sheikh. It is most appropriate that the good deeds are of the same nature as the bad deeds. But well, that is the most effective in canceling them. Tayyip. So when we talk about, and we need to just uh, make sure that we understand this point, that, that following up a bad deed with a good deed, right? Uh, Sheikh al Islam says it's most appropriate. It's not absolutely necessary, uh, but it's most appropriate. That the good deed that you're trying to do to wipe out the, the bad deed it's most appropriate that it is of the same nature as the bad deed. Tight. What does that mean? All right. 
we, we'll explain it as thoroughly but as concisely as possible, inshallah. Every evil deed that someone does is a misuse of one of Allah's favors. All right? And so when you, for example, Sayyidul Istighfar, the Prophet ﷺ taught that the, the greatest way of asking Allah for forgiveness is the dua, Allahumma anta rabbi, la ilaha illa ant, khalaqtani wa na'abduk, to the end of it. Allah, you are my Lord. There is no true deity except for you, no deity worthy of worship except for you. You have created me and I am your slave. To the end of the dua, hadith of Shaddad ibn Osa Sahih al Bukhari. So, uh, in, in part of that, that dua is Abu Ulaka bi ni'matika alayya. I confess to you, I acknowledge the favors that you have given to me, the, your favor upon me, and the favors that you have given me. Wa Abu Ulaka bi dhambi. And I acknowledge my them, my sin. What's the secret, what's the wisdom of having the one right after the other? You acknowledge Allah's favors and then you acknowledge your, your sins. Because your sins are, are misuse of, of his favors. Like, tell me a, a sin that you, you can think of, like something that maybe people do regularly. Zina. Tell you. Zina. All right. Um, I don't want to get graphic, right? But but zina, right, requires that you use a ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. The, 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 and, and this is just, this is real. The ability to have an erection is a, is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Nah. When you hit my age, it's the truth. Shake <laughs> 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 sh 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 you on the mic. Sh <laughs> <laughs> So, no, and, and, and the, reason, the reason why you know that that's, that's a reality is because of all of the potions and stuff that exist out there um, throughout the world, right, to try to help people that have, you know, dysfunction in that area. Like, that's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To use that ni'mah to disobey Allah is, what, is what's happening when a person commits Zina. I mean, that's, and that's just part of it. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other you know, things that are, that are involved with it. Like, if a person, Ghiba, uh, Namima, okay, tell you, that's a misuse of what? Of the tongue. Of the tongue. Your tongue is a nema from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, yeah. No, just let's let's work through the book. And you you you'll catch it, inshallah. Work, we'll we'll work through that. So, Sheikh Islam is saying here that for the good deeds that you want to do, in order to wipe out the bad deeds, that is most appropriate that those that those deeds are of the same nature as as the bad deed. Meaning, meaning what? That you're using the same ni'mah that you disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with to obey Allah. So if you were involved in the mima, which is a misuse of the tongue, that you increase in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the recitation of the Quran, it, you fix what you might have messed up, right? Which is, which is even, that's, that's even a higher level because that, that is actually more along the lines of toba, yeah. which we'll talk about. Which is different from, from what we're talking about here, which is the, the mukaffirat, if you will, or, or those uh, atoning deeds, the, the deeds that you do to expiate the, the, the sins. So it is about, if, if a person, you know, walked to the nightclub, right, they used their, their legs, their feet in a manner that was, dis, you know, disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now it's about walking to the masjid more. Mm -hmm. Right, increasing. I mean, thinking about all of the things that that we've done that were uh, disobedient to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Thinking about those things, and now using those favors that Allah gave you, and that you use to disobey Him, now you take it back and use them to 
obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we'll talk about that. As you'll see here, the recompense for sins. Go ahead, Shaykh. And, I, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to skip what I'm about to say, but I, I want him to read this. Go ahead, Shaykh. Uh, the recompense for sins. The recompense for sins can be averted through several things. One, toba, which is translated means repentance. Two, istighfar, asking for forgiveness, even without repentance. For Allah forgives in an answer to one's dua, even if one has not repented. However, if repentance and forgiveness are combined, that is, a person stops sinning and petition for forgiveness, then that is ideal. Okay, and then the third thing is, the third thing is, uh, the, the, the kafarat, okay? Those atoning deeds. So that's going to take us back, but I want to talk about Tobin and Istighfar uh, before we get into number three, which is, which is those deeds that cancel out, the good deeds that cancel out, out the bad deeds. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about how to cancel out the bad deeds that, that we've done through good deeds, inshallah ta'ala. But it is now time for Salat al-Maghrib, walhamdulillah. Um, so we'll pick up, inshallah, with a tawbah, al-istighfar, and, and those atoning deeds or the kafarat, inshallah, we'll pick up on August 30th. So not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, bidnillahi ta'ala, at 6.30 p.m. So class is going to move back a half an hour so that we can accommodate for Salat al-Maghrib bi idnillahi ta'ala. So we'll stop there. Um, if you do have any questions, you can ask them after the Salat, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallah wa alhamdulillah. Shalom wa alayhi 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 wa